So you know he's a nerd. He's a co-author of a book called Statistics and Kinesiology. So I bet you it was really exciting to write that book. I mean, I'm excited, you know, thinking about it. Um, also, he is a senior editor, um, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. And, and when Dr. Weir is not, you know, thinking about statistics, like while he's at home, it means he's on a motorcycle. He's either on a motorcycle or he's thinking about statistics. So uh, without, uh, <laughs> without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Joe Weir. Thanks, Joey. Can uh, y'all hear me okay? Yep. Uh, All I right. love the mountain. Well, the, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, lovely Lawrence, Kansas behind me. <laughs> but uh, the temperature is actually a little colder here than it is where that picture was taken right now. Uh, so the title that uh, is on the screen is the title that, uh, of the talk that Joy wanted me to give, but that seemed a little ambitious for 30 minutes. So this is the talk that I am going to give. Um, I'm going to get some things off my chest as a, uh, um, a reviewer and an editor and also someone who spends... Uh, more and more time, unfortunately, probably being more of a statistician than uh, a physiologist. So I got five different topics I want to cover relatively quickly about things that I think we can all do to improve not only our data analysis, but also help us uh, when we're uh, critiquing studies and also uh, reviewing papers for journals and that sort of thing. So uh, first one off the bat here, um, don't categorize continuous variables. So what do I mean by that? Um, so let's take uh, body mass index, which uh, besides being a variable that is probably uh, not the ideal variable to be using a lot of our studies anyway, but these are kind of the typical cut points for categor categorizing BMI. Um, but BMI is a continuous variable. In theory, you have an infinite number of gradations that can uh, exist between different individuals. But when we have these broad cut points here, uh, and I got this, I think, off an NIH webpage, um, that leads to some discontinuity. So that, um, for example, a BMI of 24.9, which would put you in the normal category, is not that much different from a BMI of 25.1, uh, which would put you in the overweight category. So um, why do we categorize BMI when we could treat it as a continuous variable? Well, I think one of the reasons is that um, it allows us to analyze data in a way that we're comfortable with. So if you have a fair amount of experience with analysis of variance and you're comfortable analyzing data that way, um, treating uh, BMI as continuous variable and using regression models is maybe not as comfortable for you. But um, uh, it's not an ideal situation if um, uh, the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything starts looking like a nail. Um, what are the what are the implications of categorizing continuous variables? One is the loss of information that I mentioned, but I think more importantly is the loss of statistical power. So this is a study from, uh, came out my senior year of high school, and uh, Jacob Cohen of uh, Power Analysis fame wrote this paper. And there's several papers that have uh, commented on this over the years, but I'll, I'll go ahead and go to Cohen's paper. So he ran a simulation here. So let's assume that you're looking at two variables and the correlation of the population is 0 0.30. So for our example, let's say you're just looking at the relationship between testosterone concentration, fat-free mass in females. And um, once again, so say for the sake of argument, in the, po in the population, that correlation is 0 0.30. And you wanna be able to uh, test uh, that statistically. So if we follow a null hypothesis paradigm here, the correlation, um, uh, that we're testing for the null hypothesis is that the correlation is zero. And as it turns out, um, if the population value is 0 0.30, if you have 80 subjects in your analysis, you'd have a statistical power of 0.78 to detect a uh, correlation that's not zero. And if you treat the data as continuous, as testosterone concentration would be, um, as well as fat-free mass, the analytic approach would be some sort of regression model. Um, but what if instead you split the testosterone scores into high and low? So you just went right at the mean of the sample. And so another approach then, you could take an independent t-test uh, and compare the groups on um, fat-free mass. So we have uh, half the sample is now categorized as high testosterone, half the sample is categorized as low testosterone. And if you were to do a power analysis, what you would find is that you've gone from a power of roughly 0.8 down to a power of 0.57. So you've essentially 
um, boiled your analysis down to a coin toss in terms of your ability to, to detect the difference. And if you convert that into a sample size, um, that's the equivalent of throwing 30 subjects out of your sample. So one of the great sins of statistical analysis is to throw away statistical power and dichotomizing continuous variables does that. It also affects how we conceptualize our studies. So this is a paper that just came out in Journal of Physiology, and it was actually a commentary on uh, a study that uh, was in the same issue of uh, Journal of Physiology. And uh, the commentary was, this is one of the first studies that was treating age as a continuous variable. So they're looking at age and skeletal muscle function. And so a typical design here is to take young subjects, whatever uh, the definition of that is in your study, and then older subjects, and then do some sort of comparison of the mean differences. Um, but here, the sin is that you're really throwing away information. So there's a lot happening between 35 and 65 years of age. And so if you design your studies around a, um, a model where you're uh, treating a continuous variable like a categorical variable, you're going to lose a lot of information. All right, so what's the solution? Well, uh, step one is don't do it. So if you have continuous data, leave it as a continuous variable um, and uh, be comfortable interpreting regression coefficients. Regression coefficients are effect sizes. They tell you something about, hopefully tell you something pretty important about the relationship between your independent variables and your dependent variable. And for something like age and strength, you're probably going to expect to see some nonlinearities in the data. And that's fine. You can um, model those nonlinearities with uh, some of the more advanced uh, techniques out there, like multi-level modeling. So this is all doable. All right. Uh, issue number two, DIN's error, or differences in nominal significance. So David Allison's group out of the um, University of Indiana has actually been pushing um, this in the nutrition literature a lot and writing a fair number of uh, letters to the editor and so forth, um, addressing uh, studies that have uh, committed this error. So what is the, what is the DINS error? Um, I actually came upon this uh, in an older paper by Bland and Altman. So for those of you who, uh, Bland and Altman, Bland Altman plots and so on, these are the same two people. Um, this is a paper from the journal Trials from uh, 10 years ago now. Um, but the idea of the DINS error is this, rather than comparing randomized groups directly, some researchers carry out a significance test comparing baseline with the final measure separately in each group. And the statistical impl implication of this is that you can grossly inflate your type 1 error rate. So you may set your alpha at 0.05, but depending on the conditions, your actual alpha can be as high as 0.5 or even 0.75. All right, so a little bit of an example of this, at least a conceptual model. So let's have a fairly standard um, design here. So we're going to randomize subjects to either get a supplement or a placebo. And uh, they're all going to get a pretest. Then the supplement people get the supplement, and the placebo people get the placebo, and maybe do something else to them, train them in between or something like that, and then do the post test. So you've got basically four cells here. This is a two by two model. So you've got two groups and two time periods. So the DINS approach, which is wrong, would be to do something like this and say, okay, well, I've got the supplement group and I got a pretest and post-test score on them. So why don't I do say a paired t-test on the supplement group? And then I'll do a separate paired t-test on the placebo group. And I just made this up, but this in theory could happen. If you got a P of 0.049 in your supplement group, you'd say, oh, I have a significant difference from pretest to post-test in my supplement group. And if you got a P of 0.051 in your placebo group, you'd say, oh, I have a non-significant difference between my pre and my post-test. So the supplement must work, right? I've got a significant increase in my supplement group and a not significant increase in my placebo group. But the error here is that the analysis needs to include both of those groups together. So the doing the separate analysis is what is uh, leading to this, in many ways, gross increase in type one error risk. So these are uh, simulations that Bland and Altman reported in that trials paper. And uh, don't worry so much about the x-axis here, but the idea is what is the, what is the actual alpha level on the y-axis. 
And uh, depending on the conditions, once again, you can get um, actual um, alpha levels. That is your risk of committing a type one error can be as high as 0.5. Uh, and if you have more than two groups, it can be as high as uh, 0.75. So um, under certain conditions, you're almost assured of committing a type one error if you uh, analyze those subgroups separately without first uh, analyzing them in the same analysis. So what is the proper analysis under these uh, situations? Um, so you got a two by two situation, once again, group by time. So there's a couple approaches here. So one is you could do a group by time uh, mixed analysis of variance. And in that sort of approach, the interaction effect is the interaction of interest. Um, what is just as legitimate, although a lot of people push back on this, is you could do an independent t-test on those change scores. Um, and people push back on that because there's this large literature, especially from the 80s and 90s, saying that change scores are bad. But as it turns out, um, the interaction effect from this two by two is the exact same test as the independent t-test uh, assessment of the change scores. You will get the same p-values and uh, the same uh, denominator degrees of freedom. So they are mathematically redundant uh, procedures. Uh, most stats papers though, and books will say what, what you probably should do is actually an analysis of covariance using the pretest score as the covariate. And that's a very legitimate way of analyzing the data. Um, so this would basically boil down to a one by two on the adjusted uh, post-test scores, where those post-test scores are adjusted based upon what the pretest score is. Um, and that uh, advocation of using a, a, an ANCOVA approach over the, the interaction effect here is largely an argument around statistical power. So most people will default to the argument that the ANCOVA approach is more statistically powerful than the, um, the change score or interaction effect. Um, that's not entirely true, actually. It depends upon the um, correlation between the pretest and post-test scores. So um, you can't have situations where um, the interaction test is more powerful than is using the analysis of covariance. But either of these, in my mind, are perfectly acceptable and are light years ahead of doing the um, separate analyses. All right, point number three, show your data. Now, this is not data from uh, sport nutrition or exercise physiology, but I just like the figure. I just stumbled on this on a uh, data science web page. Um, there's lots of software tools out there now for data visualization. So there's a variety of ways that uh, if you get good at this, and I'm not myself, but if you get good at this, you can uh, be creative in terms of conveying the story to your reader. And um, uh, Joey asked us all to make sure we tell a good story when we put these talks together. But when you're presenting data, you're telling a story. And so you want to have powerful visualizations to convey that, that data. So what, what is just being shown here is um, uh, data on uh, potential differences in these uh, new COVID strains. So if the R value uh, is 1.0, after 10 cycles, um, you start with 10 people, you'd have 110 infections. If the R is just a little bit higher, 1.4, so each person infects on average 1.4 other people, by 10 cycles, you're up to almost 1,000 infections. Anyway, nice graphic. But in terms of the types of studies that we do, that's probably a little bit too fancy. But I also want to, uh, I guess, hammer home the point here is that, that um, you should plot the data to, for yourself before you do any stats. Look at your data. Uh, let it talk to you a little bit before you start crunching numbers. And I've been as guilty of not doing that as anybody. You type the data into your um, Excel file and convert it to whatever you need to do to get it to run in your stats package and you hit go and, and uh, look at what the analysis is telling you, but look at your data first. Um, it's going to potentially help uh, avoid a lot of um, misfortune going forward. All right, so uh, how to show your data. I'm going to go over three uh, ways of showing data that I think I, I uh, like a lot, and especially the spaghetti plots uh, at the end here. All right, this is actually where this paper from, uh, once again, 2011 was the one that started pushing me towards this idea. Let's not use what are referred to here as dynamite plunger plots. Um, let's convey our data with the actual data being shown. So this provides you a lot, provides the reader with a lot more information 
than just what the bar graphs are going to show you. So um, uh, you get a sense of the distribution. You get a sense of, oh, well, these are kind of interesting scores up here. I wonder what's going on with that. Um, it allows you to be able to um, look for outliers, look for weird scores that maybe are data entry error. Maybe they're legitimate, but those are the types of things that you need to figure out before you hit go on your statistical analysis. So this is a, um, a scatter plot matrix that um, is able to be created with a uh, package in R, which is um, not the most user-friendly way of analyzing data, but it's probably the most powerful out there. And so I'm trying to do more and more of my work in R for a variety of reasons. But this uh, scatter plot matrix allows you to take all your variables and instead of just plotting a correlation matrix, which is essentially what is on the upper half of the diagonal here, um, it will show you your raw data. And because I have a categorical variable here, and I should point out that um, I, this categorical variable was created by um, dichotomizing a continuous variable. This is spinal cord injury data. So one of the ways of um, categorizing spinal cord injury is uh, paraplegia versus tetraplegia, so where the lesion is. But the lesion can be at any level of the spinal cord. So uh, we've been trying to be more fastidious about um, treating spinal cord level as, a, as a, an integer value when we do our analyses. But if you have a, a categorical variable here, it also will uh, make these nice little plots here on the diagonal showing the distribution of the data, at least the shape of the distribution separately by each group. So that can be kind of helpful. And uh, it's also helpful to look at what the individual plots look like. And so I've blown up one of those plots right here. So this is uh, the variable that is uh, being shown here is the motor score in spinal cord injury. So a motor assessment that's done clinically. And so what you see by plotting the data, and you wouldn't necessarily notice just by um, looking at um, plunger graphs and bar graphs and all that sort of stuff, is that we've got a bunch of people in one of the groups that all have the same score. Um, and I think the, the score here is 50 for everybody. So um, turns out that score is not wrong. That's just how this uh, clinical metric is designed but it does affect how we analyze our data now. So we have a bunch of scores that are right at 50. And um, me coming into this, not uh, being that familiar with the, the clinical measures, but being asked to analyze the data, um, I wouldn't have caught this without plotting it. And so um, if we were just to, to look at summary statistics, uh, we probably missed the fact that we need to, to think about how this motor score is um, quantified in our data set. All right, so here's uh, another way of uh, plotting the data. These are um, uh, box and whisker type plots here, except the raw data is shown. So we've got interquartile range, and then uh, actually the median here being shown. But then the most important part is the raw data. Um, so this is a comparison between um, the spinal cord injury uh, groups on uh, cerebral blood flow velocity. And show here that the the folks with the cervical lesions, the higher lesions, um, have lower cerebral blood flow velocity. And so um, once again, showing the raw data, looking at the distribution um, of, your, of your sample, I think is very helpful in terms of wrapping your head around what's going on in the data set. And spaghetti plots. So here are uh, screen captures of a couple papers that I'm a co-author on. This is um, from my former doc student's uh, dissertation work where he's looking at spinal cord stimulation, uh, not in injured folks, but in uh, college students and looking at exercise performance. Um, so this is repeated measures. So there's three different stimulation protocols and uh, time to exhaustion. The, the thick line here is the mean. The thinner lines here are the individual trajectories. And um, so I think especially in repeated measure studies, showing the individual trajectories is very important. Here's a spinal cord study again. This was looking at systolic blood pressure and um, uh, people treated either with placebo or midodrin, which is an alpha agonist. So a lot of folks with spinal cord injury are actually hypotensive. They have too low blood pressure. So 
um, in any case you're trying to increase their blood pressure. And notice that, um, you, know, you know, some people don't change much. Um, most people seem to improve, but some people's score actually goes down with midotrin. And you're not going to get that from just looking at um, bar graphs. And uh, so there's that spinal cord stimulation study again. Um, I recast that with the bar graph. And um, certainly from my perspective, the bar graph is much less informative. And I think the other thing with repeated measures that um, using a bar graph to display your data uh, can be potentially misleading is um, when folks typically take their base stats courses, they're going to look at the standard deviation here and go, oh, wow, you know, the reason you didn't have any statistical power is because the standard deviation was big. And if this was a between subjects analysis, that would be a legitimate argument. But in a repeated measures analysis, the error term of your F ratio is not influenced by the between subjects variability. It's influenced by the consistency of the shape across the repeated measures factor. So if everyone's got a consistent trajectory, even if the lines are pretty uh, uh, well separated on the Y axis, um, that between subjects variability is not going to affect your statistical power. It's the shape of these trajectories. And so you're not going to get that from um, a bar graph in this type of situation. All right, got nine minutes left. Uh, two more points here. What about the normal distribution assumptions? So I see this a fair amount in papers that I review. So folks want to be rigorous and they're going to test whether the data are normally distributed. And if they're not, then maybe they'll do some sort of non-parametric test. So this is um, a distribution of a variable I'll show you here in just a sec that is pretty bimodal. Matter of fact, it's very bimodal and it's kind of got a discontinuity here in the middle because there's a big gap. So what is this data? This is actually a summary of lots of studies that have looked at testosterone concentration in males and females. And uh, interestingly enough, I guess from my perspective, this was uh, in a law journal article. And the title of that article is Sex and Sport. And I just should warn you, um, if you're trying to find this article, don't Google sex and sport when you're at work because you're not gonna get uh, PubMed hits at the top of the list. So. Anyway, this is a legitimate article written in a law review, um, and it, uh, as you might expect, it's, it's talking about um, uh, sex differences and, and issues of trans and intersex and athletic competition and so on. All right, um, so this is about as bimodal as you can get. So females on average here say about 25 uh, nanograms per deciliter. Males, I ballpark this, and I'll say 700, and they have a bigger uh, standard deviation. So if you were looking at this and you say, well, this is bimodal, my data are not normal. Now the, the individual data, the subgroup analyses might be normal, um, but the data as a whole are not normal. So what do I do? Well, um, the first thing to realize is that this, the normal distribution assumption is the assumption that the residuals are normally distributed. It's not the assumption that your raw data are normally, assumption, uh, are normally distributed. So what, is, uh, what are residuals? The residuals are the, the errors, the differences between the actual data and the predicted values based upon your statistical model. So the simplest one here is just the regression model. Um, but this is true if we're dealing with group differences also. So analysis of variance and regression are all part of the general linear model. So anything that applies to regression applies to ANOVA. And if you do an analysis of variance, there is a regression model in the background that you're not gonna necessarily see, but it exists. So just for fun, I took those um, uh, estimates and I did a simulation. So I created two populations of scores, one for males and one for females. Uh, so the females have a mean of 25 and a standard deviation of five. And the males I centered at 700 with a standard deviation of, of 200. And then I took a random sample of 100 scores out of each of those two samples. Here's what the uh, regression model would look like, uh, even though most of us could do this with a t-test or ANOVA type of analysis. But once again, um, same process. So here are the residuals. Uh, QQ plot looks pretty ugly. And uh, if our residuals are normally distributed, we'd like you to uh, follow this line here. Here's what the distribution of residuals actually looks like. So that looks pretty ugly. What do I do? Well, you could do a non-parametric test, but I'm not a huge fan. 
Um, I think here it's more reasonable to try something like um, transform our data. So log transform the data and then uh, ran the same analysis. Now, if you do a QQ plot of your residuals, they're never falling, completely falling on this line. So is it normal enough? Reasonable people can differ. I would probably say, yeah, that's normal enough. Here's what the distribution of residuals actually looks like. Here's what the ideal distribution of residuals are. And uh, ANOVA and regression are pretty robust to these violations, especially if they're modest like this. So I'd probably do something like a log transformation and not worry about it after that. All right, last, uh, last point here, and I'm running out of time. Replication, uh, publication bias and replication. Um, this is uh, an interesting figure I stumbled on actually uh, from reading an economics blog. And so what these investigators did was they went into PubMed or Medline and basically looked at effect sizes that were reported in the literature and converted them all to Z-scores. So what you see is this big hole in the literature. We would expect to see some sort of normal distribution here. So what's going on with all of these uh, Z-scores that seem to be missing? Well, these are Z-scores that would be associated with effects that are not statistically significant. So they don't get published. So there's a whole body of literature that has not been published showing that there's no relationship between X and Y or the treatment uh, X has no effect on treatment Y. So that biases the literature. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of it is just the um, incentives that we have as academics. Um, a lot of this gets blamed on R.A. Fisher, who uh, developed a lot of our statistical procedures that we still use, setting an alpha at 0.05. I think some of that criticism of him in particular is unfair. Um, but this uh, uh, also just came out in Journal of Physiology by Simon Gandivia down in Australia, who's not a statistician, but ha wrote a commentary. And one of the, uh, I've seen this before, but I, I never found a good citation for it. So just by luck, I stumbled on this. Um, if your alpha level is 0.05, and you want to, so it's statistically significant, and you try to replicate that study, the probability of that study replicating and also meeting statistical significance in alpha 0.05 is 50%. So half of your replications will, will show a non-significant effect. So just because an alpha level is 0.05 doesn't mean that there's something there. It means that there's something that might be there. So what's the solution? Um, with respect to William Shakespeare, uh, instead of killing all the lawyers, which on, a, on its own may not be a bad idea, um, some people advocate killing all the p-values. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but we do, we do wanna make sure we're reporting more than just p-values. Um, register our trials, but I think the most important thing is to publish negative results, and it's hard to do. Journals don't like publishing negative trials. Now, there is a journal out there. Uh, this is more in psychology. Um, they want to publish negative trials. I would love to see something like this in sport and exercise science and sport and nutrition, or at least um, our journals and our reviewers being more open to publishing negative trials. Our, some of our brain and spinal cord stuff that we haven't uh, been able to show up an effect of uh, transcranial transcutaneous stimulation. Those things are hard to publish. You show something, oh, we didn't see anything. It's, well, well, we're, we're not accepting it. It's not interesting uh, enough for it. And it really biases the literature. And oops, went too far. Um, there's a summary of those points. Here's my email if you want to get a hold of me. And uh, here's what I would rather be doing rather than uh, sitting in minus uh, 17 degree temperatures, I think it's going to hit us on Monday. Thank you, Dr. Weir. That was uh, actually very interesting. Um, a couple of quick questions before we move to Grant, because uh, I know nothing about this topic. So every time I listen to a stats talk, I learn something. Number one, why are medians never used in sports science? Just sort of a random question. Um, the other one is, and I don't, I forget, I don't even know why I was reading this paper, but the gist of the paper was this, um, when you truly randomize two groups, it seems like in the sports sciences, people are so focused on make, making sure the baseline measures between both groups are the same. But in true randomization, oftentimes it's not the same. So the, I guess the second question is, does it matter if you randomize them and they're not the same, let's say they're one, or, one rep max value for the squat isn't the same. It's, you know, one group is stronger. Does it matter? 
And well, there's actually a phrase uh, that I like that called unhappy randomization, right? <laughs> so um, the, uh, and, and if you truly randomize subjects to groups, let's say you randomize them and say, and I'm, now I'm going to uh, t-test on their baseline scores. Right. And it's statistically significant. That by definition is a type one error because the, the groups were from the same population. So whatever differences you see in your sample were purely due to luck, right? Okay, yep. Now, here is a bad luck uh, due to unhappy randomization. So I think in that situation, using the pretest as a covariate um, is a pretty good solution here. Um, those those pretest scores are not biased necessarily. And um, in theory, you're sort of adjusting for those baseline differences in a way that's fair. If that makes sense. Okay. Now, the question about the median, that's actually a big question. Um, there are certain techniques as, as a, I'm becoming more of a Bayesian, um, some of these Bayesian procedures actually start looking at medians and uh, uh, intervals around medians. Um, but, but there is a large body of literature. I've got one book that showed uh, it spent like three chapters just talking about why the mean is the best choice. And it has to do with some efficiency issues um, in terms of statistical power and sample size and all that sort of stuff. So um, that's, not, um, uh, that, that's not necessarily a simple, simple question. Certain variables, if it's skewed, however, just conceptually, the median makes more sense. So if you look at income, right, they, they don't report mean family income. They report median family income because the data is so skewed. And so the median, when the data is skewed like that, um, the median gives you a better sense of central tendency. So for instance, if you look at actually the testosterone, the measures of testosterone where in regular males, 